Lemonade's Q2 earnings are coming up on Wednesday, August 2nd after market close. And I want to explain in this video why I feel this could be a pivotal quarter for Lemonade. Nothing on this channel is financial advice. And we're going to walk through my whole model from top to bottom and get a sense of where the numbers possibly could come in for this quarter. But I hope I can make the argument or at least the rationale of why I feel this could be a pivotal quarter for Lemonade. Again, nothing, absolutely nothing on this channel is personal financial advice for you and your situation. But uh, we're going to break this down and see what we all think. So any feedback you have, I really appreciate it. If you're new to the channel here, I have this Lemonade model. It is available to my Patreon members. Feel free to join my Patreon. You get full access. Thank you to everybody who's joined uh, of late. Inside this model, I have what I call my current model, which is my most up-to-date. I'm always kind of tweaking with, playing with, iterating on, improving this model. But I have a current model. And then from that current model, I have a number of graphs showing things like customer churn, customer churn over history, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different graphs here when they may become profitable on adjusted EBITDA basis, all based from this current model. And then I have what's called a cohort-based model. Inside of my cohort-based model, I'm looking at kind of a different perspective, of how you could add up the numbers, basically looking each cohort through time. If I zoom way out, give you a little quick overview. Each cohort through time, what their gross profit from each cohort could, could look like over a span of time, and then adding those up in any given quarter, the previous history of all quarters up to that time. <laughs> Real quick overview. We're not going to look really look at the cohort model much in this video, but I'll give you that overview and, and briefing. But in this video, we're talking about Q2. I'll start at the top here, and we'll work our way down. So the top numbers to look at are our total customers and our premium per customer to get our in for premium. If you look at last quarter's growth, we had a 2.7% and 1.7%. All these gray lines are quarter over quarter growth rates. So 2.7 and 1.7. I'm putting it at 2 and 1.5% to get to 1.89 million customers. I know they're still, at least what they've said is they're still planning to slow growth. They said last quarter they growed more than they intended to but still planning or, or modeling for that slower growth to gets us to 676 million of Inforce premium. Compare that to their guidance from last quarter. For this quarter was 668 is the high range. So 676 over the 668, I'm expecting they beat their top line Inforce premium again, even if the you know it's a pretty small amount to beat because their growth rates here are relatively small or even smaller than last quarter and much smaller growth rates than we had you know in previous quarters in the past. Gross earned premium, you calculate is roughly a quarter or a little bit less than a quarter of that. Reinsurance is 55% being reinsured. I have that rate in there. Now the loss ratio. This is a really important number. I might be too optimistic here, but I've put 78% in and we had 87 last quarter, 78% this quarter. That's a pretty big drop, but I think this is potential. And this is one of the reasons why this could be a big quarter, I feel like for Lemonade, a really positive quarter at least. One reason why I feel like the loss ratio could be lower is there's been less catastrophic events yeah, in the United States during this the last three months so because there's less catastrophic events other insurers are posting better numbers because of that I think there's a good chance Lemonade would as well if we look at their Q1 letter they talk about catastrophic weather events and their loss ratio without any catastrophic events and the loss ratio with it and so obviously they're they're with it I mean you have to include that so they're at 87% last quarter but if they didn't have any catastrophic events they would have been as low as 72% how much catastrophic events are they are they affected by we don't really know but i don't think something lower than 80 percent i i i should say i, th I think I think something lower than 80% is possible. And so I'm putting that in my model, given that this, this is going to continue to tr this downward trajectory. Also, they talked about an investor day and because they've had slower regulatory approval cycles for some of their bigger ticket products, because inflation's really hurt them and they're trying to up rates and, and update their rates. Those are both lagging factors that are affecting them. And I think those we might start to see those catch up. But also because of that, they said they're going to push more into renter's insurance over the last couple quarters and renter's insurance is more around like a 50 some percent loss ratio very profitable per product but a small premium product for what it is so that renters but if they're focusing just on that more profitable product for the new customers that are coming in you'd think that could you should start to see that in your loss ratio and to start to come down so i have 78 percent there and if you look out say at the end of 2024 we'll kind of in this video touch on the next you know 
year and a half or so. I have 78% and then trending down to 70, 70, sort of 6, 75% by 2024. But I think there's a, a decent chance we'll be below 80 just because catastrophic events are less, just because they're, they're doing more renter's insurance, just because some of their price increases, regulatory approval cycles, pulling out of states where they have poor regulatory approvals, th all those sort of factors should be starting to catch up and this number should be coming down. Okay, this whole block here of my model, basically calling my annual dollar retention, my customer churn, my sales and marketing fixed and variable. That's something I recently changed on my model since, since my last video. And I kind of, it's all sort of interconnected. So I'll sort of explain how it works. So Lemonade gives this value annual dollar retention or ADR. But if you read the definition of ADR, it's, it's how much premium a cohort of customers retains over a 12 month period. So 87% last quarter would just mean that the customers from Q1 of 2022, 12 months prior, those customers, that cohort of customers, that group of customers, they had a certain amount of certain amount of premium at that time. And then some of their premium might be increasing as customers get more products or, or buy you know more expensive products. But also customers are leaving the are leaving lemonade or lemonade might even be canceling customers. So there's customers exiting and you have what means is 87% of the dollars that were part of their IFP before are now still uh, in that cohort or 87% are left. But there's two factors there. You know, there's how the premium per customer is changing and there's also how many customers are churning inside of there. From that, I've calculated for previous quarters, I've calculated how much churn, because we know how roughly how the premium per customer is changing. Also, investor day, they gave me, I talked to some of the management and gave me a hint. My numbers were slightly too pessimistic. So I get sort of a 2% factor within there. Do a bit of that math and you get, you can calculate the churn. How many customers, basically 300,000 customers churned from 12 months prior, a lot of customers. And also 21% of the customers before are the ones that are churning. So you can calculate those values and then get a nice historical picture of what the churn is on a 12 month basis. And I'll show you a picture of that. And it has been trending down all the way from, it was 40% if you're back in 2020, all the way sort of rose, came back down and it's trending down all the way to 21% last quarter. I don't think this number is perfectly accurate because we don't know. We only know the premium per customer for the whole group of business, not the exact cohort that we're talking about. But I think it's probably very close. And from the discussions I had with management and investor day, I think my number is very close and then got closer when I added in this 2% factor. But it gives us this nice historical picture that we can then model this variable based on into the future. So this is one of my inputs then, what I'm using to calculate some of my sales and marketing spend. And so I've put 21%, 21%, 21% for the next few quarters. And I actually have that rising to 23% because right now I know they're onboarding more renters than other customers and renters tend to have more churn. So I'm increasing that a little bit and then I have that going back down to 21%. Long term, I see that going to maybe 20%, maybe even less than 20%. I don't know if they get much better than that. Just depends kind of on the mix of their book of business, how many people are renters, how many people are more stable. And that's a difficult sort of thing to predict because it's based on how much they're growing into new countries, places, etc. But this is a good number, I think, for the next few quarters, maybe 21%. You can see then the annual dollar retention is calculated from that based on, on that input. And annual dollar retention actually have dropped. I think there's a pretty good chance annual dollar retention will drop a little bit from 87%. And some people might be alarmed by that, think there's more people churning, even if the churn is still 21% because they don't release this number. But that wouldn't concern me at all if it drops a couple percentage point. The reason it could drop or it might drop is because the premium per customer for that cohort uh, hasn't risen as much. Again, we don't really know this because we don't know exactly. We only know the whole pool of customers. We don't know 12 months prior, this cohort of Q2 2022 that was onboarded. We don't know exactly what those customers, their premium per customer could be. But there's been less change in premium per customer over the last, especially the last couple quarters that I'm expecting. And when premium per customer is rising faster, it makes annual dollar retention look better. So when it's not rising as fast, then it's going to, it could kind of pull that number down. So either way, just some commentary there. So you have some understanding on that. Another value I'm calculating from historical values or from the past and then projecting into the future is the customer acquisition cost on a per customer basis. So 
CAC here. What is that value over time? And I had it previously in my model. I had this just as a how much they're spending uh, of total SNM spend, so all sales and marketing to get a customer. But then I recently discovered that really they have a sort of fixed sales and marketing expenditure, which would make sense, sort of a fixed fee on sales and marketing. And then also what you could call a sales and marketing variable spend, or maybe what you're spending on CAC, which is really what you're spending on advertising and really you're you're measuring your metrics around how much premium, how many customers you're getting based on what you're spending. So I broke down the sales and marketing in the past and then still have that total amount here and that percentage of that as a percentage of gross and premium, but then have sales and marketing fixed and sales and marketing as CAC spend. And Tim Bixby gave me a little clue here on Twitter. He talked about how in their 10Q these numbers are released, which show this breakdown. So I went through all the 10 Qs and 10 Ks and tried to piece together what the sales and marketing variable amount would be. It was actually very confusing because they always gave it as a relative value. It was this quarter was 9.63 million less than Q1 of 2022. Everything was relative. So I was like, I kind of worked it out uh, based on the data point that Tim gave me in that tweet and then a few other data points I could find. Some of it I had to essentially when I'm figuring out the sales and marketing, you know, variable amount for, you know, for example, quarter quarter two, three, four of last year, I didn't actually know what the breakdown was would be, but I knew what Q1 would be and I knew what the whole year would be. So then based on Q1 and based on the whole year, I was able to estimate what it could be. Now, these wouldn't actually be equal, but it gives you some idea. And then from that, I'm able to then calculate this CAC per customer, how much they're spending to get each customer. And this isn't just a net customer gain, but it's it's the total customer gain, gain including customers that would churn away. So this is like how much you're spending, including the customers that are churning away. And we're at $128 per customer last quarter. It's also a bit messy in here because they had the Metro Mile acquisition, which throws off some of the numbers. So some of these, if you're looking really carefully, you'll see some of the equations have some small changes or adjustments to account for that Metro Mile uh, acquisition. But I looked at the last several years on a customer acquisition basis and basically got a number of 148 bucks a customer. Could even be less. I feel like this quarter might be less. Like last quarter was 128 because they're probably getting more renters right now. And renters, I would think it's a less competitive market, but I put in 148, just use that average number over the next uh, kind of indefinitely. That could increase depending on their product mix going forward out, you know, looking out a few more years. But the advantage of Lemonade, the huge advantage is they have, they're building this whole ecosystem from renter's insurance up, like kind of this unloved product of renter's insurance. So even long-term, they can keep onboarding customers at probably a lower rate. And because of their efficiency, they can compete in the renter space and still have a, you know, a 50 some percent loss ratio based on what they're pricing it at and really profitable product right up front. But also those customers, you know, eventually might get other products and really uh, increase the amount of premium they're bringing in, even though they were a small cost up front for Lemonade. And that's really the beauty of lemonade structure and really you know a huge part of their thesis and also assume one other thing i had to sort of input was my sales and marketing fix don't know what that will be but again i looked over the last few years and got about an 11 million per quarter average and then have just done a one percent quarter over quarter increase so that's slowly increasing that should be a line that you see a lot of operating leverage but based on all that you can then calculate you know what your cac cost was in the past input into the future and also what your fixed rate is and put that into the future and then you can calculate how much they're going to be spending uh, into the future on CAC spend to grow including in that then of course you can sum that with the fixed and you can get your total sales and marketing and you can see I have it about 18% 18% as a percentage of grocer and premium and actually increasing a bit and you'll see that's because I have a lot more growth coming and happening and then eventually decreasing and you know eventually going down below 10% all the way to even you know 5% of your gross earn premium in the long, long term. Again, if you want to play with this model yourself, you want to support the channel, I do really appreciate the support and you can join the Patreon group. And then another interesting metric they added was how much CAC spend do you make to get enforced, how much enforced premium gain do you get from that? What's that ratio of IFP gained for CAC expenditure? And you can see last quarter was just over three. Previous quarters in here are a little bit, I think are going to be closer to two points, high twos to three, just because this one's too high 
high and these ones are too low, that's because this these amounts wouldn't be equal amounts as I sort of discussed earlier. But you can look out all the way back to 2020. I did tweet this out the other day that back at their time of their IPO, they spent they had a one to two ratio, and now we've recently calculated that it's more like a one to three ratio. Shout out to Domine for those calculations again. But it was around two. We can see actually measured here, it's about three. And then you'll see to see it's like it should keep increasing. And because it will increase, keep increasing because of your whole customer. You're sure you're spending a certain amount and you're gaining a certain amount from that IFP. But this is this is looking at the whole IFP of the whole pool of customers. So there might be certain customers that spend 60 bucks a year, 100 bucks a year on renter's insurance, and then suddenly go out buy car insurance for another $1,500 a year, and their whole their book of business did like a 15x for that customer and Lemonade spent maybe $0 on marketing to them. So that's why this number should really start to increase. And you can see based on where we're going, our premium per customer at the top, you can see it starts to grow to four into the four range over the next two years. It'll eventually go five, six, seven, even have it as high as eight, nine, close to 10 by, you know, mid 2030s. So way, way, way more productive marketing. And that's not, it's not because they're suddenly better at writing, you know, copy or advertisements for their marketing. I mean, that could help. Then that's certainly something they could, you can always keep improving on. But it's because the pool, the whole base of customers, there's more customers that then just start adding more products and bundling more products. And there might even be customers that churn and leave for whatever reason. You know, they have a transient life and then they get a more stable life and then they come back and they just maybe for zero dollar spend, they, they come back to Lemonade for free essentially and add premium back. And this ratio too is not just simple simply it's not i'm not calculating calculating it simply as the acquisition you know what what your premium per customer is divided by your acquisition cost per customer it's not that simple uh, because if you did it that way, it doesn't include the, that's looking at a per customer basis and it doesn't include the customers that churned away. What I'm trying to do and calculate for is including those customers that churned away so that we can model for that churned of value over time. So now we're going to move on to the synthetic agents portion, at least how I, I don't know how exactly the counting will be done by Lemonade for this, but here's how I'm representing it in my model. I have synthetic agent percentage of CAC spend which we know can be up to 80%. And then from that, I can calculate how much the synthetic agents are spending on the cu customer acquisition. And then I have a line that I'm inputting called synthetic agent interest paid by Lemonade. So the 80% and this value are pretty straightforward what they're, what uh, synthetic agents are paying. 80% is just going to be 80% of the variable CAC spend. So I'm assuming, oh, the synthetic agents, you know, next, not this quarter, because synthetic agents, I don't think have taken effect yet, but now in Q3, what we're actually living in right now, I'm assuming, okay, 80% of the 19... 0.7 million they spend is going to be covered by uh, through kind of their line of credit synthetic agent line. But then Lemonade oh, pays them, has sort of an interest they're paying back from the premium generated by that. So how much is that interest? You might wonder. Well, I, you, if we jumped over here to my cohort base model, this is where I uh, use this model to calculate what that interest could be. So in this model, which again, I gave a really quick overview of earlier in the video, but you have all these different cohorts and their loss ratio or their premiums descending over time for each one. And then you sum up for any given quarter, all the premiums of the past up to that current quarter. That's sort of the roughly how this whole model works. But inside of here, I structured, you can, I can put values for whether there's synthetic agents in a given quarter or not, sort of turn those really easily off or on and it'll update all the numbers accordingly. But I have turned it on for the next six quarters and I've assumed their synthetic agent spend per quarter starts at 15 million, 15 million, and then ramps up to 20, 30, 35, 35. So you get maybe, you know, roughly ballpark of 150 million. I then actually use these top line enforced premium numbers and made my top lines, if we scroll up here, my enforced premium numbers be very close 
to what those are. But then to calculate, scrolling back down, to calculate this interest that Lemonade has to pay back to the synthetic agent people, what I did is I used this cohort model and I fixed my cohort's gross earned premium. I didn't, because that can, in this model, I will adjust back and forth uh, based on whether synthetic agents are on or off. But I fixed that whether as if the synthetic agents were on. And then I looked at the value of each quarter what's summed up as if the synthetic agents were there and as if they weren't there. So I basically did that math and if you do that math and you think, okay, for sure we know synthetic agents are going to be probably for the next six quarters of time and all these highlighted cells is where there's something being subtracted that we're, we're calculating or adding up. Then you know all the way till the end of 2026, Lemonade might be paying some synthetic agent interest because there's still being this line here you're adding this up it still has some small effect even to the end q4 of 2026 which is roughly you know about nine uh nine quarters or 27 months that they said about two to three year payback period so it's a bit of an estimation but i think it's a very good estimation here and we we did that math and put that back here in my in my model my current model here what i'm calling current model in this line so we have zero dollar most of the time there's just zero dollars but for the next six quarters and actually then beyond all the way to the end of 2026 I have values in there and these are all values that are hurting lemonade really lemonade is paying the bill for so in this you know q2 could be or q3 sorry could be really good quarter I mean we're looking at q2 but then we're also thinking about the next quarters after q2 being the quarter this you know that's coming up this week but then afterwards the synthetic agents could actually be taking 15 you know 16 million of the the expenses away but lemonade only has to pay 2 million back to them and it keeps kind of going like that like the expense Expenses grow, grow, and lemonade. The synthetic agents are appropriately taking more of the cost too, as we had that top line growth growing further. Uh, but your 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 interest that lemonade's paying is growing as well. And then after that, this is where it's going to hurt. And actually, my adjusted EBITDA in 2025 actually gets worse and then gets better again, as you'll see down below. But 2025, say they don't get any more synthetic agents or they stop using them. Them, we don't know if that's the case or not. They might even structure later on another synthetic agent uh, grouping on top of this who knows but then your synthetic agent benefit goes to zero but lemonade's still paying 19 you know 19 19 18 16 million uh in interest back so then you're getting hurt but it, and it's you know it's bringing that value down so if you even if you look here by the end say they've paid off all their interest from this loan we have 174 million in interest payments but they're actually getting covered for 123 million. So it's about a $50 million difference there, but they're, what they are getting is a lot of accelerated growth up front with less risk. As I've shown in other videos, more growth is a good thing, whether it's coming from synthetic agents or their top line spend. But in this case, they're not actually hurting their own cash balance. They're keeping that fully intact, having this loan to get to profitability sooner than it might. 2025 might actually be a more painful year because you're not getting that benefit. But who knows? They might even renew the synthetic agent structure again or layer another one on top of it. We don't know that yet. Other insurance expense I have growing at 4% quarter over quarter sort of indefinitely that was last quarter that could be much more jumpy much higher much lower but I'm hoping that stays around there we'll see more of a question mark on that one tech development I have growing at 2% quarter over quarter and then 1% and then back to sort of 1 2% 2% long term quarter over quarter but it was minus 7% last quarter so you'd think most of their tech has been built out and they I mean they still they still would have the team that's big enough to keep doing what they want to accomplish right now. So you would think there'd be minimal, fairly flat there under tech development. General administrative, they had 5% last quarter. This can jump around quite a bit if you look at previous years and quarters. I have it only growing at 2%, maybe that's too conservative, but 2% into the future. And that's just based on comments from management that has said, hey, we have everything we need operationally, administratively to, to really grow this business and really see operating leverage. So I'm expecting, you know, they can keep growing the top line and this number should stay fairly flat with minimal growth. You add up all this and you get a total expenses line. And I should mention too, with the synthetic agents, for example, you know, in Q3, I am including now <clears throat> the synthetic agent CAC spend and also the interest 
in that. So I'm subtracting out whatever the synthetic agent is covering for their CAC spend and then adding back in whatever lemonade is paying to get your total expense line. That's how I'm basically accounting for the synthetic agents right now. And you get total expenses as a percent of gross earned premium dropping from 63 to 61%. This is where total expenses have tracked over time continuing to come down and where I'm forecasting a total expenses eventually dropping down to you know 20% to 15% as a, and even below that maybe even 13 12% as a percentage of gross earned premium. Stock based compensation I have at 50 15 million that's roughly where it's been I have that for the next you know few years kind of indefinitely put it there might need to adjust that further into the future I'm showing it there then you get to adjusted EBITDA really the most one of the most important numbers so we were at about 50 million last quarter I'm forecasting about minus 45 million this quarter this will be a pretty big beat because they said in Q2 their guidance was for 55 to 58 million but again I feel like less catastrophic events they tend to have a history of saying one giving one guidance then beating the guidance have a history of beating their own guidance so I think I'm saying something like mid 40 millions for adjusted EBITDA is where I'm landing. And then if you look at the whole year, the next couple quarters really drop because the synthetic agents are jumping in there. Have 15 million, 16 million for the next two quarters while you're only paying a smaller amount, two or four million. Because of that, adjusted EBITDA really is dropping. And for the full year, I have about 165 million in adjusted EBITDA with that synthetic agent effect included, which would be a huge beat on the 200 to 205 million, which was their revised guidance last quarter for the full year so i feel like again this is again why i feel like this could be a pivotal quarter because i don't think these numbers are crazy and a synthetic agent effect i think could really improve this year's guidance i feel like there's a good chance we beat and then the guidance is updated again maybe it's not as optimistic maybe i'm wrong maybe some of the expenses are higher but we're more in this range and that kind of signal to the market again two quarters in a row where we beat and then the guidance is updated more positively could uh, it could really signal to the market hey lemonade serious and they're really going to become profitable and once the market kind of i think figures that out i think my opinion is the stock could just take off and that's why i'm wondering if this quarter is a pivotal time for that and if you look at my graph for adjusted ebitda projections there's sort of all the money we've been losing thus far here's the money we've been losing thus far and you see it gets actually a little bit worse it gets better 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 and then worse in 2025 if the synthetic agents are not renewed and then you kind of have to foot the bill for the insurance you're paying that back and then it gets better 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 and i have you know 2026 20, 27 27 reaching profitability and then really scaling off from there you know by q4 of 2030 i'm about 200 million profit per quarter so maybe about 800 million at adjusted EBITDA on a run rate then 2035 you're at more like 1. billion dollars plus on a quarterly basis so maybe four or five billion dollars a quarter or a year another thing to think about is what's their cash at their cash and cash equivalents right about 900 and some uh, million dollars right now close to a billion where does that go over time and then also what's the cash requirement because as insurer they based on the reinsurance uh, how much reinsurance they have this really changes the value by you know by multiple but this this is how much cash do they need to have on hand to kind of cover the amount of premium they're writing so as their premium grows this amount grows but then as if you're loss making then you you know that's cutting away from the amount you have so i've called it just the difference there difference between the cash they have and the cash requirement we look at graphs of those two things the cash uh, is also going to stay positive currently how we have a model of course again this model is sort of always iterating and changing but and then the cash requirement the difference there i mean it gets really close to nothing <laughs> in q4 2025 and then it gets better but this really close to nothing and then jumping back up is because we've assumed in 2025 up to 2025 there's a three to one I have P to cash requirement and then I have that jumping up to seven I don't really know what the requirement is right now I know at investor day they talked about aiming for a 6x in the past they were more like a 7x and then they moved to change their reinsurance a little bit or like a 3x requirement so I don't know what they're at right now but it very well could be maybe they're more like a 6x across the board change all those numbers to 6x and then you look back at the cash requirement plus or minus you can see 
it might get close. They might need to do some capital raise later on this decade, especially if the stock price rises. I could see that, but it, they should be okay. And that's kind of where I'm at with the numbers. A few other improvements I'm going to make to this model in the future is adding in their share dilution and then also share price from that instead of just looking at, I do have some calculations, rough calculations on where their market cap could end up. Adding in some of those share details and dilution. Also adding in their investment income, which I have not included at all. And then also adding in their give back, which talked about a little bit recently uh, is a really small percentage, like a fraction fraction of a percent of their IFP. But I plan to still add all those details in. And this is kind of, I hope this video was illustrated for you of my whole model, but also to show, hey, I think this could be a pivotal quarter and here's why. I hope that broke it down for you. I'd love to hear what you guys are thinking about the quarter and about my model. Again, if you want to support the channel and you want full access, feel free to join my Patreon. It's five bucks a month right now. Thank you so much for watching and remember, it's in the bag.